Um, our next speaker is Dan York. Uh, Dan is the director of Internet Technology at the Internet Society. And in 2022, he led the organization's lower orbit satellite project, seeking to understand the benefits and challenges of this new way to provide internet access. Uh, with the Internet Society, Dan has also had roles involving DNS security, web security, TLS, IPv6, communications, IETF participation, and more. Prior to joining the Internet Society in 2011, Dan spent over 10 years working with voice over IP security and was involved with Linux and other open source technologies. Since the mid 1980s, Dan has been working with online communication technologies and helping businesses and organizations understand how to use and participate in those new media. Dan frequently presents at conferences, has authored multiple books, participates in several podcasts, and writes extensively online. So I welcome Dan. Please go ahead and you can share your slides. Thank you very much. I'm actually going to present through my my screen. So if you're in speaker mode, you'll see me here as far as the presentation. So uh, thank you for having me here. I'm glad you're doing these these seminars and these sessions because it is a, a critical time. I'm absolutely fascinated by what the last speaker talked about because when we have these orbiting computers that are up there that are circulating around, and when we get into the Leo space with literally thousands of them. And they're orbiting over parts of the world where they don't need to connect to something on the ground. You know, it, it seems it seems a bit of a waste to have them just sitting up there not doing anything directly. And so when we get into this world now where we have inter-satellite lasers and the ability to communicate between them, suddenly this world of edge computing or CDN caching or all of those things opens up in ways that that we just we haven't seen before. So uh, it's a fascinating time. I'm, I'm glad that we're doing this session and that we're talking about things here. So like you said, my name is Dan York. I'm with the Internet Society. We're a global nonprofit that's 30 years old and focused on really, um, you know, our, our mission, our goal, our vision is that the Internet is for everyone. And so we look at how do we connect people around the world and how do we bring them to an open, globally connected, secure, trustworthy Internet. And we've been giving a lot of thought around how do we connect the unconnected. And back in 2022, we started to look at what does that mean for LEOs, low Earth orbit satellites. And, and I say LEOs, you could say LEO, whatever. They're the same kind of thing. We've got that up there. Um, we've certainly seen all the marketing and all the press. We get a lot of that all around what's going on with that. And we've certainly seen that the interest is coming around, you know, to anybody listening to this, you're well aware, right? Traditional satellite connectivity is not necessarily ready for the world that we want that needs low latency and high speed connections for all of this, especially as we move on toward looking at what happens with, you know, virtual worlds or some spaces like that. And it just doesn't work to have the satellites that are way out at, you know, geosynchronous at 36,000 kilometers and having everything down in the low earth orbit is where so much of this is moving to. The, the challenge, I think the interest has also happened that we're at this point in time when rocket technology is so much different than it was. We've got reusable launch systems. You know, you, you watch what happens with SpaceX and they're constantly reusing the systems that are there. The mass production of the satellites, if you talk to, we've talked to SpaceX and Amazon and the others who are just, you know, stamping out these satellites, uh, multiple satellites per day. It's not something that you would do in, in the age of geosynchronous satellites or pieces like that. And you've got companies like SpaceX that are doing both. So we went into a project trying to say, you know, is this good for the open internet? Is this uh, not so good? Is it bad? Is it terrible? What's the kind of space? We spent a lot of time. We came out with a document, which you can get if you just go to internetsociety.org slash leos, L-E-O-S, and you could read our perspectives document where we talked about a lot of the, the questions and the things that we think we need to be thinking about. And I was delighted to come here because I think there's some real questions that the academic community in particular can be helping this, this broader societal as we look at the how these what role these play. Our end answer was really, we don't know. Because the answer right now is that the Leo industry is so new and there's so many different questions. Some of the ones uh, you know we think about a lot is we see the opportunity. You know, you can go anywhere and see the tremendous opportunity with with uh, with Leo systems to connect people. I live in northern Vermont, and I where I live, I have great access here in the United States. But other people who are just 15 minutes away from me don't have access. 
but getting a Starlink terminal has been has been life changing. They've been able to do things that many of us take for for granted. You know, just watch a movie, stream a show, engage with a game, do things like that. But we're seeing that story repeated again and again for community centers. We do a lot of work with community networks where people are looking at bringing in you know Wi-Fi or mobile networks or pieces like that, and they're using Leo systems for backhaul, connect connectivity back to the rest of the internet. And again, this is changing things around. Uh, I'm a volunteer with the IT Disaster Resource Center or ITDRC here in the United States, and they do a lot of work bringing connectivity to places after disasters. And just recently at Hurricane with Hurricane Ian in Florida here in the U.S., they um, deployed their trailers down there, which have Wi-Fi and cellular connectivity, and they were using Starlink for, for connectivity back there. It, it's a game changer for some of the folks doing activity like that. The question, of course, is at what cost? What does this all mean? What are we doing that? One of the challenges I think we see as a society is really how do we get these things up there? How do we deploy them? If you're SpaceX, of course, you've got the integrated, you've got the launch systems, you've got the satellite, you can do all of that. If you're OneWeb, if you're Amazon, if you're Astra, if you're Boeing, any of these other systems, you have to figure out how to launch your systems. You have to get those up there and deployed. You have to create your user terminals, your antennas, all those pieces like that. You have to align up with ground stations. And you have to go around to every single country in the world and find out whether you can operate in their network. You have to get the approvals for, for all of that, for the constellations, the spectrum usage, those pieces are there. So when we look at what the challenges are ahead of us, we looked at some, and I think we have to think about this, affordability. If we really want to connect the truly unconnected, can some of these systems be affordable for those who need it most? Don't know yet. The Starlink model, the direct-to-consumer model they use there is affordable in some areas, not affordable in others. They're changing their pricing. They've adjusted a bit, but even still, it's challenging. I think as we see competition from more of these players, as OneWeb comes fully online, as Amazon launches, we'll see more, but that's a, a, a critical question. I'll come back to capacity, but that's a critical one because as we go and connect more devices, as we look at connecting more of these, where um, do we have the capacity to truly use and connect everything we want to connect? We don't know. The competition one is a macro level piece too. If we wind up getting... Uh, you know, space-based internet access becomes ubiquitous. And if it succeeds and really becomes a viable point around that, who's in control of it? Right now, a number of the entities are large corporations. There's some governments looking to get involved in some way. But as a society, we need to be thinking through, is that the form of internet access we want in some ways? The policy issues we could have an entire talk about. I'm not going to take that time here, but to say that the spectrum allocation issues are very important all around this world. I was recently speaking to uh, the folks in Armenia at an Armenian Internet Governance Forum, and somebody on stage was asking the regulator about, you know, when can we get Starlink in our in Armenia, in our country? And he was very frank in saying it's not going to happen anytime soon because they turn out to use the same spectrum that Starlink needs for the Armenian military and for their national security and everything else. And it's not something that they can easily transition away from. Yes, they can share it, but you wind up with interference with other kinds of issues like that. In that particular country, it may be a while before Starlink or any of these other systems can get inside of there. There are interference issues that around that. There's competition from local you know, mobile telephone companies who would like to use some of that same spectrum for rolling out 5G. There's a lot of issues that are going on there. If you're not aware of it, the International Telecommunications Union will have its World Radio Conference, or WRC, later this year in Dubai. And this is going to be one of those times when the international community comes together and talks about a lot of these kinds of issues and these allocation issues, these orbit issues, all of those. It will be a big part of, I think, what, what you'll see going on this year. There's all of the security, privacy, open standards, interoperability. You know, I it... it it pains me a bit because I watch what's happening with the LEO deployments, and I suspect we're going to have completely separate and incompatible LEO systems that are going to be up there. If you're aware of how we deployed wireless telephones, mobile telephones here in the United States, we built 
four different infrastructures, physical infrastructures around the country. We had Verizon and AT&T and Sprint and others. We had different systems. All of them were incompatible. You had to use different phones, all of that. Whereas in much of the rest of the world, it, people standardized on GSM and, and built common platforms and common things where you could be able to use that. I suspect the Leo environment is heading the way that we did mobile telephone rollout here in the United States in having completely separate and incompatible systems. I suspect that's how it's going to go. Can we change that? Can things interoperate? I don't know, but this is one of those questions that I think we're looking at. The space debris one is a, a huge issue. All of the players are involved in that, but this is a, uh, these are questions that I think we have to answer as we continue to launch more of these. There are these questions too. How many of these business models are sustainable? How many of these systems will be around as we launch more and more of these? The environmental impacts, not only of launching, but I'll bring up another one in a minute. The impact on astronomy. These are questions that all of us who are active in this field need to be asking in some way. The urgency and the reason why I mentioned this and ask us all to be thinking about this beyond, you know, beyond um, the technology, but thinking about broader is just because these next few years are going to see some pretty tremendous growth. Starlink is on its way to completing what's called its Generation 1 or Gen 1 shell. And then it has approval to do part of its Gen 2 shell and is looking to do the rest of that. OneWeb is hoping to complete its satellites over the next uh, this year or so with some a uh, couple of additional launches. Amazon is planning to launch its Project Kuiper or its first satellites this year to begin their process. China has a constellation called Guoyang, which is out there and it's it's in the process of being built. And just this past couple of weeks, the European Union uh, voted to proceed with their Iris constellation, which is looking to go and do this. When you look at the numbers, I don't even have Iris actually in this list. But if you look at the numbers that are here, you can see Starlink is looking at close to 34, 35,000 satellites. OneWeb is planning that they'll have around 7,000 by the time they're done if they for their second phase. Amazon has, you know, as you can see here, 7, 13 for China, more and more and on. You know, about 90,000 90,000 low earth orbit satellites are looking to be deployed over the next 5 to 6 years. And at the very bottom, there is filing for, in the ITU from uh, uh, an organization in Rwanda for 337,000 LEO satellites. Now, how many of these will actually be launched? How many of these will go live? We don't know, but these are the, this is the context in which all of this is happening in some way. From the internet size point of view, we would love to see more research around capacity and around measurements because we don't actually understand the full ca the, the capacity of these systems that are out there. The vendors for various reasons are not necessarily being, you know, they're not necessarily saying exactly how their systems work and all of those. And I think as we get more and more of these launched, as Starlink brings its Gen 2, its larger satellites online, when it has, you know, full inter-satellite lasers across all of the systems are there and the ways they're going, we're going to see a lot more capacity, a lot more interesting things being done. There's been some talk and some look at what would happen if you if you wanted to connect from New York to Frankfurt, for instance, right now, you would go today by satellite cable or a subsea cable under the ocean and, and pop up over there and through systems like that. With these new systems, it's very conceivable you could connect up to Starlink from New York, pop across their constellation and drop down to Frankfurt there. Is that faster, better, all of those things? A lot of open questions. There's not a lot of independent research. I point you to one place, Starlink.sx, which is a, a gentleman who's gone and done a lot of research around capacity and modeling it. Uh, certainly from our perspective, we'd love to see even more research into this kind of capacity that's out there. The other space is this whole environmental issue. This was a, a post on Mastodon recently where somebody was pointing out that uh, if these systems are all launched and they are have a five-year lifespan, Basically, you are continually replacing, right? And each one of these at the end of its five years is going to be burning up in the upper atmosphere. Her calculation said it was about 23 sats per day. If you actually look at the full build out, if we were to get there, you're up at probably about 50 sats a day burning up in the upper atmosphere. What does that do to the upper atmosphere? Do we actually know? I, I've not seen any research around that. I'd love it if we did see some research. And that's that's those are areas that are spaces that uh, that people could do. 
Uh, I'll end with just a couple of comments and throw out some questions. One is to tell you folks who are here and coming from the academic space that uh, an organization that we have, the Internet Society Foundation, does have a research grant program. And it is a program It opens up in April and in, in September this year will be the, the times for applying for funding where they will you know, provide large amounts of funding to research organizations that want to go into some of these particular kinds of areas. And that environmental one I mentioned is particularly fits into the greening of the Internet. I actually recently spoke to the, the director of the program officer with this program, and she would love any kind of applications around uh, you know, environmental impacts of Leo systems or things around that. So pay, watch, pay attention on uh, in April when the uh, isocfoundation.org, when the research grant programs opens up and you can sign up for their newsletter if you'd like to as well. I'll also mention that we have a new program for event sponsorship where you can go and re receive funding to promote events or things with local technical communities that can help, um, that can help you uh, will help fund events to help build uh, communities or get people talking about these kind of issues. So you're welcome to look at that as well. So there's a lot of potential. I think uh, the question that we all have is how do we shape this future? Again, I would encourage you to take a look at our document. I'd love to hear your feedback. And you can just, I'm York at isoc.org. I'll put that in the, in the chat, but I would love your feedback. We're looking to, re to revise the document later this year. So I would welcome any comments or feedback that you all have. And I'd love pointers to papers or other documents that you've done in this Leo space as well. You're also welcome to join us. We are a membership organization. Membership's free, and you can find out more, more about us with that. So I see a couple of questions, and uh, I'll be glad to take them. Okay, let me look down here. Yeah. I see. Okay. So thank yeah, you for so, a very interesting talk. Yeah, please go, go ahead. ahead. Yeah, we have a question here from from uh, Dibuban. So Dibuban, you would like to? Yeah, I see it. Do you have any thoughts on how we could do space policing and hold entities accountable? Yeah, this is a whole area, and there actually is a um, within the UN. There's a there's a whole agreement around this, and there is um, elements around it. And this comes back to partly the licensing. Um, for instance, the here in the United States, okay, to back up, if you're going to launch satellites, you need to get approval from the regulator in the country that you are in. Yep. And so here in the United States, SpaceX and Amazon need to get approval from the US FCC in order to launch because that's the country they're in. As part of that approval now, the FCC is mandating that all satellites must be deorbited within five years of their lifespan. And so, for instance, and so the FCC is using some of these conditions in order to encourage behavior that is appropriate like that. So that's part of it. I think the other part is that there are agreements, there are things happening within the UN agencies around who has who has responsibility and all of that. So it's it, it is happening. There's a lot of focus around this because collisions are obviously not good for anyone involved. Thanks. Um, and the uh, related to that. Uh, there actually there is a whole realm of startups that are looking at becoming the satellite cleanup systems. You know, <laughs> you can imagine. You know, people going up there and doing that. There's even a there's a there's one proposal. There's a system that that satellites will actually have a grappling mechanism attached to them, so it, a cleanup um, system, a space tugboat or space whatever you want to call it, could go and grab onto the satellite and do that. Now, of course, you also say people look at that offensively and say somebody could go, a state actor or other could go and use that to start grab other people's satellites. And so, you know, you get into this whole space around that, but there's a lot of interest in around that. Yeah, so we have also a question from Nitinder. So if we consider the Leo provider as a global ISV, so how we can incentivize more competition and space so we can overall have a continuous quality of service to improve? Yeah, uh, this is a challenge, I think, partly because we have this, this fundamental issue that it costs a lot to go and, and, and do this, you know, so it's, it's not an easy thing for somebody else to just to jump into and, and be competitive. And so you do right now have large companies by billionaires and, and others who are launching these systems and doing this because they're able to get the investment and capital to go on in there. I think we need to encourage a variety of different models. 
you know, uh, the I'm intrigued. I'll be interested to see what the EU does with their IRIS because they're looking to go and, and provide government funding, provide to go and, and do this. Will they be able to get up another another constellation? Um, I, I don't know. I, I think we do need to encourage a variety of different models, though, to do that. Uh, I don't, you know, if we go back to the early stages of the internet, right, and so much of the early internet and the different models came out of universities and nonprofits and other entities, I'm not sure how we launch our own rockets, but it'd be great if we could figure it out. Yeah. Okay, so another question. So uh, as opposite, uh, opposite to the uh, radio frequency, which require frequency coordination, what do you think uh, of the optical links, which require no license or coordination as alternative for RF technology? Yeah, it's this is a whole area. So for folks who are for right now, we use um, radio spectrum to communicate between the the user terminal, the antenna, and the satellite, and the satellite to the ground station, and that's the way we do that. And so you need spectrum allocation. You need to do all of that, uh, and then in between the satellites, they've now moved to where they're able to do these inter satellite lasers, where they can go and connect between, literally create a mesh above our Earth in this way. The, uh, there's a growing amount of interest and in work in, in optical downlink to the ground stations and being able to go and do that. I think it's a fascinating space. I don't know that we have enough information or research. I know some of the folks who have been involved in looking at that, and it has its own challenges, weather-related sometimes and other pieces around that. So, But I'm intrigued. It'll be very interesting to see what we can do with that. Yeah, I, I totally agree. The weather might be the the key challenge here because of the frequency and the and the, yeah, but it's definitely an area to look at. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it it, it could solve a lot of our challenges. I think uh, with that, and in, including different what from what I've seen, some of the different higher you know throughput higher pieces around that. But I think we're still still work in progress. Yeah. This could also be a hybrid uh, radio and laser. Downlinks, yeah. right? Yeah. Yep. Because yep. you know you, you get the best of both worlds. So you could uh, mitigate weather to some degree, versus you could also get uh, high bandwidth, and the weather yeah. is good. Yeah. Yep. And you could have you know yeah all of those things. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, we have another comment here is that we should uh, find an alternative method method to launch this uh, satellite. Many rocket launches can improve the Earth's environment. Yeah, this is the other aspect, right? If you're launching all of these rockets, um, and and if you think about, if we get to the point that you know, like SpaceX did a hundred launches this past year, and they're and they're launching more now, and and those weren't all Starlink. There were many other customers, et cetera. But if you get to the point where you're going and changing out, if you have to change out satellites constantly because they have a five year lifespan, you're pretty much always launching. And if all of these companies actually launch we're going to have just a ton of rockets that are launching up into space all the time. And, and so there is, there is an environmental impact around that. What does that, what does that do? What does that mean? What is it, you know, for all of the fuel, all of the exhaust, all the different pieces. And there's been various studies around that, but that is a, I think an open challenge. I know there's a, there's the one company that's looking to do the, uh, the launching from, from a, a plane, you know, bring it, bring it up to a certain altitude and then launch from there. Although they're, again, they're still using a rocket to get out from there. But mm. yeah, if we could just invent anti-gravity, we could really solve a lot of things here. I don't know if anybody's working on that, but. <laughs> yeah, so talking about the space uh, debris, I think uh, Nishant pointed to some work here. So maybe a link to look at. Uh, also, there's also another company, a true scale. There's a lot of, doing a lot of work about this cleaning. Uh, yeah, we have another question about the multi or, uh, multiple or const uh, constellation versus inter uh, interworking within constellation among many vendors. It could uh, it would seem to be to 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 the eyes of technology and networking stack would be a good place to explore centralization. Yeah, so and I with different yeah. And I saw I I saw some stuff around. I, I I agree. I think that if we can figure out how to have you know the interconnection between those different. Um, satellites that are up there. If we have those different kinds of the, if, if they're using common protocol stacks, if they're using common, you know, inter methods of interconnecting between the satellite, you know, certainly when we when we've done testing and stuff on that line, they're 
you know, if I go on a Starlink connection, it looks just like any other IP connection from the user experience, right? I'm connecting up there. But we don't actually really know what's going on in the space-based element of that. You know, we know the connectivity from my my computer to the to the to the uh, satellite or, or to the to the antenna, and we know from the ground station to the rest of the internet. That's common internet protocol. Calls that's that's all there, but we don't necessarily know what's being uh, what's being um what's being done in the space based side of that. So I I agree. It would be great to know and it would be great to understand more. And I th I hope that vendors as they continue to deploy their systems will be open and forthcoming around that. I also I also have a feeling that we will at some point we converge to that because this is how internet actually converged, right? So multiple ISPs, multiple I don't know system are connected to each other. Yep. And and that form the internet. So at some point in the future, Starlink, OneWeb, and many of these, we might have the the chance to interconnect like exactly the internet does now. Well, but there's yeah. there's a company uh, that is looking at how do you have internet exchange points in space? You know, space based mm -hmm. internet exchange points where you do that kind of interconnection up there, and that and that may be one path to do it. You would think just for the resiliency. It would be in the vendor's interest to go and do that, right? Just so that you, because, you know, there's other unknowns that we haven't dealt with. What if there's a major solar flare that comes in here? Space weather is a whole other aspect around yeah. this. We don't actually know yet because we haven't done this. We're This is a whole brand new world, right? We've launched more satellites in the last couple of years than we have launched in the history of, of, of satellites, just in terms of operational satellites that are up there. Um, and... So yeah, we don't know. It would be great if they, I think they'll have to look at that in some kind of way. Standardized ground stations, yes, as well. And, and you'll look at some of the different players that are in that space and, and including Amazon with its ground station service and other different kinds of spaces. There's a lot of folks involved in that. Yeah, we also have a question about the rainfall and the, the impact of the high frequency transmission. So talking about the optical wireless and optical links. Uh... So what is the impact of the rain on the lake communica uh, communication satellites? Yeah, so, um, well, I guess you're about to find out because Nigeria has just uh, yeah. had Starlink go live. So I guess we'll know. <laughs> Let's stay tuned. If, if you're in Nigeria, it'd be great for you to do some research around that type of thing. The I've known folks who have who have Starlink and have said, you know, much of the time it works fine in rain and things, you know, when there were hurricanes or stuff, it did not work as much. But I think it will vastly depend upon the quality, the quantity of rain in the space that you're in. But it is an issue. It's, you know, you're not going to get you won't have the connection you would have in fiber. Yeah. OK, another question. So. Um... Is there any active research going on using millimeter wave or uh, THS uh, telemeter, uh, telemeter waves for intersatellite link instead of laser intersatellite links? Yeah, I, my, I don't know. I, I don't have an answer for you on that one. I've mostly seen a lot of the work has been around uh, ISLs uh, because I think some of the uh, traditional communication has been via um, uh, RF communication. And so now, you know, the, it's kind of viewed as a, you know, the, the ISLs are viewed as the next evolution of that. But I don't know if there's been research around millimeter waves or, or other ways around that. So, yeah. So another one, which is uh, there are few applications that will benefit from Leo Geo and Earth, 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 Earth ground station links. Any thoughts on this direction? Yeah, what, what they're calling multi-orbit constellations is certainly um, a, a growing interest, a growing area of interest. Let's be honest, a number of the geostationary providers, the geo providers are looking at, well, hey, we, we've been we've been providing internet access for decades, folks, you know, and, you know, why is Starlink getting all the attention? And they're looking at how do they either partner with LEO providers or in some cases launch their own LEO systems themselves, or a couple are looking at um, uh, medium earth orbit uh, MEO satellites as well, yeah. and looking at how do you use the combination to provide that the um, you know the benefit of a geo that is has a constant location, so you're not dealing with beam forming and tracking satellites and everything else. You just you have a constant signal there, and combine that with the low latency of the of the leos or meos, so that you can be able to provide the the low latency high speed connectivity you need while also being able to provide a consistent back connection for throughput. A lot of 
fascinating discussions in that space. Ultimately, all these systems have to launch, you know, before yeah. we can know how that all works. Yeah, I think another question about the standardization as well. So like we have GSM standard, is it possible to have a standard to allow communication between consultations? Yeah, and that's, yeah. there is some work going on in that space in different places. I think we have to see uh, what, what they all do, you know, yeah. uh, and how open they are to participating in that. Um, if you look at the, the, the geo market uh, as another example, you know, there's a, there's a standard for communication between your local router and the antenna that you have. So that the, so that when, once you've installed the large, the antenna, whatever, but you switch providers, you can switch your equipment and still be able to use that, that antenna. I'm not sure it's going to happen in the Leo space because they're small antennas, you know, size of a pizza box or so that are all integrated electronics, integrated everything inside of that. And so it's a different kind of model around that. It's a consumer model. You know, it's a cons oh. consumer equipment type of thing. Um, it's also, you know, much less expensive than those geo antennas may be in different ways. Uh, yes, there are radio-based IS, well, radio-based inter-satellite communication, inter-satellite inter links, yes. And this is where you've seen some acronym expansion, right? Because ISL was inter-satellite links, and then people tried to do ISLL for inter-satellite inter laser links, which kind of just got abbreviated down to ISL being inter-satellite lasers. Yeah. You know. I think we are just on time. So let's thank the speaker again. Thank you, Dan, for the very interesting talk. Uh, we're glad to have you here. And uh, looking forward for uh, further uh, talks and uh, sessions.